I'm going to explore with you today how our inner fears manifest in our outer behavior and how by dealing directly with those fears, we can change our personal behavior and shift the world toward greater peace, justice, and well-being. Can you remember when you were a very small child and your mother put you to bed in a dark room and you were absolutely terrified of the monsters that you just knew were hiding under the bed? That was my experience every single night. And in fact, I learned to jump farther and farther so that I could avoid the attacks that were definitely waiting for me from under the bed. But don't we all have such fears, whether they be bears or snakes or drowning? But the question is, are they real or are they the placeholders for other deeper fears of which we may not even be fully aware what they are? So, writ large, how can we possibly solve large-scale complex problems if the stakeholders to those problems don't trust each other and are in fact even afraid of each other? The terrible thing is that most people actually suffer from those fears and therefore are to a certain extent closed. So trauma carries an old story and even if the trauma is in the past and no longer relevant to our present lives, it still possesses us and keeps us small unless we do the inner work to transcend our fears. So I'm gonna talk with you about something deeply personal, how actually when we have these fears, we shrink ourselves into a smaller life, a smaller space in order to stay safe, but limit the potential for our lives. So in my experience, exploring those fears in the context of a safe group can help us overcome shame, anxiety, and even depression. I believe that fear is the opposite of love, and that love can open the heart and reopen the possibility of feeling gratitude and expressing that love out in the world. Feeling safer allows trust to begin to appear, and it is key to finding the common solutions that we all seek for the world and for ourselves. But to be our most impactful leader self, we have to do the work on our relationships, at work, and in the world. So I'm gonna talk with you about the process of this, and then I'm gonna take it to the large screen and tell you the story of a very courageous group of people in India who worked together on the issue of child malnutrition and produced major results. So in my own story, I lived a life of constant anxiety. It was from childhood traumas that actually had become to seem normal to me. Probably not worse than many other people had, had experienced, in fact, probably much less bad. But nevertheless, those, those traumas stuck with me and kept me in that state of anxiety. Then, when I turned 50, I allowed myself to take a vacation for two weeks with family and friends. And during that time, I allowed a long suppressed voice, it was a tyrannical voice that dictated me every day and caused the anxiety, which said, be good or do good every moment or you're not worth living. That voice was allowed to just temporarily step to the side. And the unstructured time, which I allowed myself, opened some space which allowed me to feel the fear that lay behind my pretty bound life. It was quite terrifying, actually, to hear these new voices saying things like, I want to run away from home, or I want to move to Montana and live in the wilderness and write a book. But I actually was able to listen to those new voices. Something loosened. 
the old voice which had kept me in this state of fear, made me not always present to family and friends, quite demanding of my co-workers. I felt as though if I was going to work this hard and should, then they should too and unable to maintain an intimate relationship over a long period of time. I had no intuitive or generous voice to offer to the world because of these strict boundaries related to fear. But the process that I engaged in led to a shift which inspired the creation of retreats into the wilderness which I had also had the opportunity for when I moved to Montana in the wilderness, so that I could create a similar effect for others. Not that this was easy. In fact, to today, that harsh voice still follows me, and I need to engage regularly in practices to soften it. Practices like meditation or yoga, deep breathing, moving my body, being in the outside, so what I'm on is a path, not a destination. It's a way of getting there, and it's a daily practice. But being vulnerable, as I am being now, seems to offer the hope to others that being vulnerable can be worth it in terms of opening our heart and inspiring trust in others. So lest you think that my story is either unique or only as a result of the privilege and the access with which I grew up. Let me tell you the story of someone else. Melvin grew up poor in Africa and very sad. He came from a family where there were no financial resources, but he wanted to help others. As a member of Synergos' global network of civil society leaders, he came to one of the retreats that we offer at my place in Montana. And he came with a sense of heaviness, a depression, a longing, a dissatisfaction. Through the work he did in the group and alone, he began to trust the group enough to face what really had happened to him in his life. That his mother, who was so busy just trying to keep the family alive, had really not had the energy to love him in the way that children need to be loved in order to flourish. And, this was the hard part for him, that as a result of that, he had not been able to love his family and his wife in the way that he wished he could have. This led him to terrible shame and pain and sadness, but also to a certain sense of relief and release. And his recognition about himself then allowed him to go back into his world and his life and his work and create similar retreats for the hundreds and thousands of teachers with whom he was working in a poor state of a country in Africa where they were trying to reform the education system. These retreats for teachers who became valued through the experience turned out to be the most significant factor in that state going from last to second in one year in the country in terms of educational achievement. So he used the same process that opened him to feel pain and overcome fear for the teachers who then did that for hundreds of thousands of children in that country. So what were the key ingredients to the shift that both Melvin and I, and now hundreds of others, have experienced, and how could we take this out into the world? First is the possibility of participating in a safe space, in a group where you can actually come to trust the other people and express your vulnerability. It always happens that someone utters a long-held painful truth, and the truth is followed often by tears, and the tears become a lubricant for opening other people's hearts. So in the course of this process, we listen to our dreams, we meditate, we pray, and in the time that we spend outside in the wilderness, we connect with the earth in a way that is deeply, deeply nourishing 
And again, we move our bodies, get the stress out of our bodies. So when we come back from these wilderness retreats, we tell the story to the guides. The guides listen empathically, and they mirror back to us what we've been reflecting on, which is, what is my purpose in being here on this earth? And we hear it in a different way that illuminates our perspective. We are helped to realize what our true gifts are and what it is we want to bring back to our people. So this is really an amazing thing, that facing our fears can not only transform our own personal lives and our relationships, but if a group of people intentionally works together on their purpose and what they want to do and the solving of a problem out there in the world, it creates a field of trust and creativity that can lead to much greater results in the world. So now, come with me to India, where we, Synergos, were invited to participate, along with other stakeholders, in a large-scale initiative to reduce undernutrition in the state of Maharashtra, a state of 100 million people, a state where the rate of stunting, which is the most serious form of malnutrition that affects permanently the child's physical and mental capacity was 39%. That means that two out of five children would never reach their full potential. What a tragedy. This rate is even higher than in much poorer African countries. But why was this the case? Despite economic growth in India, was it the Indian bureaucracy, which is famous for slowing things down? Was it corruption, siphoning off some 20 billion a year that the government is spending on child malnutrition? Was it wrong strategies? Or could it have been the lack of supply chain, the coordination? These were daunting questions, and there was nothing easy about discovering the answers. There was distrust and conflict across the sectors. Uh, the business sector thought the government was lazy and corrupt. The government asked the NGOs and civil society, who elected you to make decisions? And both government and civil society thought that government was simply ineffective and that business was uh, greedy. So second factor was that there was high leadership turnover. Every time we would build trust among the key stakeholders, somebody would leave one of the key organizations and we had to start all over to bring them into the process and to enable them to feel safe and trusting and trusted. So as a result of this complicated process, Synergos actually had to hold the space for two and a half years until enough consistent trust was built so that uh, they could create their own organization, the Bavisha Alliance. So how did we find our way through this complicated situation? Well, the first was overcoming the fears and mistrust by creating a safe group. So we sent them out in groups of five or six for a week-long learning journey to look at the problem from the ground up. And they would look through their respective but different lenses every day and then come back and talk about it at night, really to try to understand the system. By the end of the week, they were able to discuss their learnings in such a way that they really empathized and understood each other's perspectives and were able to co-create as collaborators, not adversaries. Then, we sent them on a three-day and three-night retreat in the Himalayan mountains simply to reflect on their fundamental purpose in life. There was massive resistance to this, but they went and they prayed for each other and amazingly, some of them even had the same dream on the same night. But they created a field that transcended the fears and the resistance and the disagreements. They told their stories on coming back of their time alone. They shared intimate insights that probably they'd never told anybody in life. They wept, their hearts opened to each other. Raji, who was the UNICEF representative, said that, oh, you know, we all have baggage and we try to ignore it, but actually this time, 
we had to deal with it. And uh, Manish from Unilever, one of our key partners, on seeing the situation of child malnutrition in India, decided he wanted to devote the rest of his life to working on these collaborative processes to help people come together and work together to overcome serious issues in the world. So the retreat strengthened trust and mutual commitment, and this led to a creative brainstorming. There was electricity in the air that hadn't been there before. I'll just mention two of the successes out of a number that were identified as the key ones. The first was a program to teach adolescent girls, probably soon to be mothers themselves, about their own health and their own sanitation practices, breastfeeding practices, and about prenatal care. And the second was done by the Taj Hotel chefs of the Tata Corporation, which was one of the key partners in this initiative, where they went out and looked at the tastes of people around the state and came up with three recipes which then replaced the government PAP. And they were much more tasty, much more nutritious, easy to prepare, and fit within the 10 cents a day budget that the government allowed. And then the corporate board decided we were done. This was devastating to the other partners because we hadn't even spread statewide yet, much less to the rest of the country, which was the aspiration. We were proud of what we thought we'd accomplished, but there was essentially no data. Until a year later, a UNICEF study revealed that unlike any other part of India, the rate of stunting, the most severe malnutrition, had gone down from 39 to 23%, a reduction of over half a million children who now would have productive lives out of a total of stunted children nationwide. So this couldn't have been only the case of the pilot programs working so well, because they weren't even statewide. It had to have been the effect of the increased competence, self-confidence, and trust that the group of stakeholders had developed among themselves, and which enabled them later to be vulnerable to each other. So if they had the problem, they could ask for help from one of the other stakeholders. So if groups like these could do this, what other problems could we solve out there in the world by using this kind of method? I think the most important lesson that I've learned in my life is that trust and open-heartedness are the cornerstones of personal realization and powerful social change. But we need an infrastructure of trust, an infrastructure to create it and a process for doing so in order to solve the most pressing problems that are out there. And we need to invest in it. We can heal the world, but only with the deeply pattern-shifting processes and explorations into our fears that I've described here. So I would leave you with just this question. How can each of you begin your walk in the wilderness? Thank you.